Okay, thank you very much, Pete, for taking a lead and handling all the organization structure of these webinars. With that, as Pete already said, my name is James Jackson. I am a program specialist for the Department of Ecosystem Science and Management, and I'm based here in Stephenville, Texas. The topic that we're going to be talking about today is fence line brush control. And however, lots of these methods that we're talking about are not limited to a fence line and vice versa. Those that are in the pastoral are also very applicable on a fence line. So with that, we're going to go ahead and look at a few reasons of why you would want to control the bruts on a fence line. If anybody has ever paid to have a fence built, you know that's a very high dollar investment. And typically whenever you go spend the money to get a fence built, you want to keep it where you can see it. So one reason right there is prolonging the lifespan of the fence. As we have talked about in some of our other webinars and some of our other programs, we've talked a lot about the benefits of prescribed fire. Well, any time that you have a fence growing up in woody plants, that gives the fence a higher possible possibility of damage from the fire. Keeping the fence line clean helps that out. However, wood and post also come into consideration though. Something else that's been brought up is with the price of land today in Texas being anywhere from 1500 to 4000 an acre. And I realize that can vary a ton depending on where you are at. That offers us more of an incentive to maintain the amount of acres that we have where we can continue to utilize those acres. And lots of times you start out with a little bit of brush on the fence line, then as it goes on, the fence line becomes a 10 foot buffer going through your place. So by maintaining that brush on the fence line, you maintain your amount of grazable acres. Something else that I kept running across when I was doing research on putting together this presentation is increased safety from blind spots. How many times have you been pulling out of the pastoral trying to look, see if anybody's coming down the highway and all you can see is juniper trees in the fence line. Well, if that bruts had been cleared out, it'd be a lot easier to pull out on the highway. Okay, something else I wanted to look at was fence lines impacting on the real estate value. I know that here in Erath County, real estate changes hands pretty often. I've talked to some of our realtors in the area, and they say on average, every seven years, a place sells here in Erath County. And that's kind of hard to put a value on the fence line. But one thing I was able to find is if the future owner wishes to continue the present operation, then the owner who put a fence around it will probably regain his money. And something else that's very hard to put a dollar value on, but we've all been told good fences make great neighbors. By keeping a livestock on their side of the place, many a times keeps the arguments down between the landowners. Okay, let's look at the cost of a basic five strand fence. These costs that I got are from a local fence builder here in the Stephenville area. To do a plain Jane five strand fence would be right around 12,000 a mile. To do a sheep and goat net wire fence, you're looking at around 17,000 a mile. 
There is the very popular high gain fence that we keep seeing popping up all over Texas, 24,000 a mile. When you spend that kind of money, I hope you ought to maintain it. Let's look at a little bit of an example. Let's say you have a six in a land. That's 640 acres. Very basic math. 50,000 nearly, 70,000 for the sheep and goat fence, and for the eight foot game fence right around 96,000. Outside of the initial cost of the land itself, lots of times the fencing is one of the highest cost items that you could put on land. Okay, now I'm going to start looking at some mechanical methods. Let's look at the benefits and the negatives. I always like to look at the pros and the cons. The benefits, you remove the brush right away. I like to say, face it, we live in an instant gratification society. We all carry around our smartphones. We don't know the answer to something, you pull out your phone and you Google it. Something else is you make the fence look more attractive. Like my wife is with our yard, she wants it to look great immediately. I try to tell her, hey, let's hold up. It will take a little bit of time. Well, she wants it done right away. On the negatives, many a times we'll go chop down a brush in the fence line, trying to remove it right away. However, they'll be re-sprouting. Lots of times, to prevent the re-sprouting, depending on the species, the mesquite and the juniper, they require some stump treatment. That in turn becomes more work. And also, if you're trying to run a chainsaw in and around a fence, I've done that a lot, can kind of be a challenge, something to think about. Okay. You can get as simple or as high class as what you'd want to. Here are some very simple mechanical type methods. However, I know we used to be able to hire a high school kid to come clean out fence for seven bucks an hour. I know that because I did a lot of it growing up in the little town of Meridian in Central Texas. If you can find somebody who can do that, great, best of luck. However, those are harder to come by. And if you're going to do one of those trees, use the lopples, the handsaw, the chainsaw, I'm going to recommend you come back through and you do this. Where you would spray that stump with the herbicide right there to prevent it from re-sprouting. As you can see right here, there's a mesquite and another hardwood. Spraying that with a mix of 15% Remedy and 85% Diesel, if you spray all the way around it, cover the entire surface, you will not have any re-sprouting. However, for your other trees, you're like your red berry juniper, that's a common re-sprouter, here's another mix that'll do well. 4% Tordon, a little bit of surfactant. The blue dye is just for you. If you know good what you're doing, feel free to leave out the blue dye. If you're like me, can be a little bit forgetful at times, go ahead and add some in. Blue dye is pretty cheap. This one right here would be mixed in water. This right here will have a very much an oily base to it. Being that you use Remedy and Diesel, there is no water in that mix. Also, typically I never recommend to put any dye in this one. The reason being, you'll see some oily on top of the stump. Okay, a few more mechanical methods. This is the last resort. This is what I like to call a pressing the reset button on the fence's clock. It's grown up, completely enclosed in a brush, so he hired the dozer to come in. 
on average, what I can find in talking to some people, a dozer was right around $100 an hour. Lots of those small little skid steers are very effective. My brother from down in San Antonio, he works for Hope Cat. He'll be glad to rent you one. He finds, he tells me on average $200 a day for a little skid steer. What you'll find is lots of these herbicides can be a lot cheaper in the long run. Okay, here are some of our standard brush control treatments. If many of y'all are aware of the extension brush buster program, these are the treatments that the brush busters recommend. From, we're going to look at the mesquite, juniper, and prickly pear today. Okay, the mesquite leaf spray. And if you're spraying mesquite in the pastoral, spraying it in the fence line, this solution will do a good job for you. This is a 1% solution, and you're going to do 1% Sendero mixed in water. You're going to do a quarter percent surfactant, then a little bit of blue dye. Use water as the carrier, and you wet our foliage to a glisten. If you wet it to the point it's running off, all you're doing is you're spraying the ground beneath the mesquite tree. We're not trying to kill the grass, we're trying to kill the mesquite. The way I like to tell the people this right here, use a 1% solution. Think about a gallon. A gallon is right at 128 ounces. Therefore, calculate 1% of that and you'll have it. The nozzles that we recommend are X6 through an X8. You can find these at some ag supply places. Here lately I've been ordering mine offline. That seems to be the easiest deal. And just look for a Conazet nozzle. Okay, the timing for when to treat mesquite. The soil temp needs to be 75 degrees at 12 inches deep. If you follow the extension range unit on their Facebook page, it's called Texas Rains. You've been seeing or you've been posting soil temp updates. Last week I was over in Glen Rose, Texas. I took the soil temp and it was 72. That's getting pretty close, but not quite there yet. I'm guessing that if we wait, we're having some 90 degree days this week, we'll be up to 75 at 12 inches deep. Some of my colleagues down in South Texas have already seen the 75 degrees. The leaves, they need to be a uniform dark green. And the canopy needs to be in good shape. I know up here we had some hull this year. The hull probably is going to mess up a little bit of the canopy. Sometimes on some very dry years, we'll have a lot of grasshopper damage. Last year we had a late frost that took out some of the mesquite canopy. The main deal is you want a good canopy of leaves to soak in that herbicide. If the top of the tree has been removed, if that tree's been cut down, been shredded, anything like that, typically allow a couple of grown seasons. Get that tree up to four or five feet tall before you try to spray it. If you try to spray the regrowth and it's only one foot tall, you're going to have a harder time killing that tree simply because the root system is very well established and you do not have enough of a canopy to get enough herbicide to kill it. Excuse me, I kind of skip it around a little bit to the mesquite beans. 
The mesquite beans, ideally, they need to be absent. However, if they are present, they need to be fully elongated. What we are trying to get at here is the mesquite tree does not need to be sending nutrients to the beans. We want that mesquite tree taking in the nutrients from the leaves and sending them right down to the bud zone to kill the tree. Okay, here is a little bit on the carbohydrates with flow. And now let's look at a question. Thank you, Pete. Let's look at when conditions are right to treat mesquite. Go ahead and vote if y'all vote to. As they're, as they're voting, uh, let, me, let me just mention that uh, if y'all have any questions, uh, feel free to type them out in the chat pod and we will, we will get uh, to them. And the other thing, the website that uh, uh, where the soil temperature is being posted is on our Facebook fan page. So it'd be facebook.com slash TX range. Thank you, Pete. Okay, I see most of y'all are paying attention. If the plant is actively growing, that one right there would be sending nutrients going up. When the plants actively grow and the carbohydrates are flowing up like this, you do not vote that. You vote the carbs to be flowing down to the bud zone. The way I like to talk about this and compare it is think about trying to food poison somebody who's fasting. I know it's kind of crude, but I hope it makes sense. If the person is not willing to eat, what good is that doing? However, when this mesquite tree puts on leaves at the beginning of the growing season, what it's doing is it's taking nutrients from the base down here and bringing them up. And then we go try to spray the leaves. <clears throat> what good have we done? Absolutely none. However, we wait till the soil warms up to 75 degrees. We wait till this becomes a uniform dark olive green. And then we go spray it. And then we're sending the nutrients back down to the bud zone. If you wait till that happens, you'll get a good mortality rate on spraying your mesquite. Okay, mesquite's kind of a across the board a problem all over the state, but lots of landowners also have problems with greenbrier taking over the fence line. And right now, let's look at this fence right here. We have a fence line with a little bit of greenbrier on it. And now we'll go to the next slide. Here we have greenbrier with a little bit of fence in it. Green and brow is a difficult one to control. To begin with, green and brow has a root system that's very impressive. Very thick tubules on the root systems. And it also, on the leaves, it develops a waxy coating. So the green and brow has the advantage. However, our current green and brow recommendation it's 25% remedy and 75% diesel. Use a X1 to a X2 nozzle and that will reduce the amount of waste. By using these nozzles, you'll cut it way back and use approximately only 80%, and you, excuse me, you, you will use 80% less herbicide than what you would use using that X8 nozzle. You'll spray the lower 12 inches of the stem and that'll do a good job of controlling it. This lots of people like to do in the fall just because it's easier to get to and also we're about to be going into the months of 100 degrees. If you're going to spray green prior out level do it with it's cooler myself. Okay, here are some research applied research that we've been looking at on Greenbrow. 
This was done back in 2010. And then we had to change the personnel here at Stephenville. And we have not done as good a job continuing it as we should. But last year I put out some plots and I'm getting the one year evaluations this summer. And this year I'm continuing to put out some more plots. But what we will do in here is we'll spray in the leaves. It's finding the stem on a bunch of green briar can be a, a challenge. And I don't know how many people are going to do that. But I feel that if we could develop a spray recommendation where you could ride down the fence line and spray the leaves, that'd be a pretty good deal. Let's look at what we're doing right here. We're using Remedy Archer and Saparol, and we're getting anywhere from 50 to 75% mortality. You see, we are using up to six grams to the gallon of saparol and we're keeping it at two percent remedy this stuff over here it looks really good but forget about it that is an experimental compound that is not on the market yet we're hoping that we're going to get it on the market and if we do we have a good use for it Okay, now let's talk a little bit about juniper control. J little red berry and blueberry juniper. This does very good on. 1% tordon, a little bit of surfactant, and some blue dye. Once again, the blue dye is optional. However, I would say go ahead and use it just to see which ones you treat it. This is one of those you need to thoroughly wet all the foliage. So by every foot of tree height you add, you're going to significantly increase the cost. So for small little plants, this does great. However, as they increase in size, it becomes cost prohibitive. Prickly pear control, saw them out. So mount's a good way to go on a prickly pear. However, I wanted to add something else in that the Tordon 22K also does well. Only look at this. The Sormout has two active ingredients, picloram and a fluoxapyl. The Tordon 22K only has picloram. Therefore, it will take a lot longer to get a good kill on prickly pear with Tordon than by using Sormount. The recommended rate of Sormount is 1% with a quarter percent surfactant that's using a non-ionic surfactant and a quarter to one half percent blue dye. Okay, something else on fence lines that works really good is the herbicide known as spike. Those two types of spike, there is a 20P, that is a pelleted herbicide, and the ADDF. Only I cannot trust this enough about spike. It is a non-selective herbicide, meaning it does not know a good tree from a bad tree. The spike 20P is a dry granular herbicide. You apply it at a rate of 10 to 20 pounds per acre. It has in the past been sold in small cycle cans. Something kind of like what you treat fire ants with. Only instead of treat, shaking it on the ant bed, you do it on the brush. The spike 20P is Commonly applied by aircraft. It's used a lot in far west Texas. And it is also used periodically down in south Texas. Does a good job at controlling the south Texas brush and the creosote bus in west Texas. The spike ADDF 
That is a flowable powder. And if you look at the label, according to the label, five pounds of this product will treat 4,356 feet of fence in a banded application. You'd apply this at a rate of five gallons per acre, and you'd use a tray tree nozzle that we're about to look at. This is an application that Bob Lyons, the associate department head, came up with for applying the spike ADDF down in South Texas. And if you look, he has his three nozzles. And what he was doing is he was driving this down along the fence to try to maintain a roadway where you could drive through on the fence line. Here is an up close picture of the nozzles he was using. Does a tray tree nozzle. Another thing you can do is you can plug up these two nozzles right here and just treat right next to the fence. Here is an example of why we do not recommend spike close to live oak trees. It is a very good herbicide for its purpose, but it can be used out of hand. Okay, I mentioned that South Texas stuff that Dr. Bob Lines was doing. Here is his resorts in Kenny and Zavala counties. Right around 70%. Pretty good mortality rate, considering the fact he was doing one to pass through. Okay, another broad spectrum herbicide that works very well for fence line brush control is Velipar L. Look at all the stuff Velipar is known to control. And look what's in red with it. And it also does a very good job of controlling that. How many of y'all have told the story about the Treaty Oak down in Austin? Velipar was used on the Treaty Oak. Here are some of the benefits. Control multiple species with one herbicide. Very low volume application. You do not have to have a private applicator's license. And it is very simplified application equipment. Very low cost. When I calculate it out of the cost to the mill, it's right around four cents a mill. Only I cannot overemphasize this. Does not know the difference. And yes, as Pete is saying, please feel free to ask questions. <clears throat> okay, let's look at a couple of different applications methods for Velipar L. Typically in a banded application, you would apply two to four gallons of Velipar per acre. So that would mean you'd mix one gallon of Velipar with five gallons of water. And you'd apply it to the base of the brush. Something I wanted to caution you on this is it may take multiple seasons for the plant to reach full mortality. What Velipar can do is you'll treat the plant one time, and then you come back next year and it looks about halfway dead. Come back the year for that, and it's a little bit closer to die. And over time, you will wipe out the plant. The spot treatment application, it works very well on the juniper trees, also on the mesquites. If you apply two to four cc's per three foot of canopy width, this is when you would use an undiluted herbicide. When you would use like an exact measure or device such as a drench gun. And once again, it may take a little while. Here are some of the application methods for Velipar. 
DuPont used to sell this still right here. It looks like an old seepage wrench bladder. Only this long nozzle hair on the gun is pretty handy. And you can set this right here to measure 2 to 4 cc's where you know exactly what you're putting out. Something like this also works well just you're going to be getting down and bending your back a little bit more. Okay, here is an applied resource update. In some of our fence line brush control plots, we have seen a velipar to be very effective on smaller to mid-sized junipers. And this is two to four feet in height. And this is applied at a rate of two gallons per mile of fence line. However, we have seen that done in a few locations. We need to do a few more plots before we develop a broad spectrum recommendation. Okay. However, if you look at our extension REM 1466, and we'll get into that here in a minute, you'll see some recommendations for South Texas mixed brush. And one option, option A, is an IPT method using half percent tecloram and half percent tricolopero. That's a great method if you're going to mix up a tank on the back of a four-wheeler and go right down the fence line and it'll spray everything. Does a pretty good job. If you're going to broadcast it, here is what I would recommend. 32 ounces of the acre of pickle ram. That would be something like Tordon 22K and 16 ounces to the acre of Tricolopair. Tricolopair is the active ingredient in Remedy. Another option would be half percent Pecloram and half a percent Chloperolid. At a broadcast rate, this would translate into 32 ounces of Pecloram. And I know that's kind of a variance right there, 11 to 21 of Chloperolid. But in that neighborhood, depending on what you'll get, I'm going to tell you to consult your county extension agent and they'll help you develop that recommendation. Davis Mountains, this is using spike right here. If you're going to broadcast to treat mixed brush in the Davis Mountains, seven and a half to ten pounds of pellets per acre. However, individual plant treatment would be half an ounce of pellets per 50 to 100 square feet. That gets very difficult to calibrate, but that's kind of a guideline, a target that you would aim at. Okay, a minute ago I mentioned the REM 1466 publication. This is Extension Chemical, Extension's Chemical Weed and Brush Control Recommendations. Every method in here has been tested on multiple sites over multiple years across the state of Texas. If it's in here, we got a pretty good idea of what it's going to do and it's going to work. Something else is this is commonly, this is used by NRCS as the technical reference guide. So if you go into your NRCS office and say you want to aerial treat a mesquite, and some of the practices that they're going to give you that meet the criteria for NRCS's cost sale program would be in this publication. If it's not in the publication, NRCS is going to try to steer you to something that is in this publication, or they're going to back out of it. Okay, if you look in the first page right there, is how to use this guide. We're not going to go all through that, but 
go to the AgriLife bookstore or go talk to your local county extension agent and they can help you get your hands on this publication. Okay, here is all of the weed and brush species that are listed in this guide. And we're always working on adding more to it. Okay, here's a page I want to bring some attention to. Well, let me go to the next page. Here's all the recommendations. Say you want to treat some of this stuff right here. Say you want to do ragweed, cuckleball, croton. It's going to say the herbicide name. Say we want to do dicamba and 2,4-D. It's going to tell you your rate is 16 to 32 ounces to the acre. There's your spray volume. And there are some other remarks about it. Now let's go back to this page. We see dicamba and 2,4-D. And that product is sold as Weed Master, Banneville, and there are some other names. This right here is not an exhaustive list. There may be some products with those active ingredients that we do not list on this page. However, we try to do as good a job as we can. Okay, we're getting to the end. I wanted to go through some fence line stuff with you. Right here is a fence line right here. Fence is in good shape. We can still control the brush and we can save the fence line. You'll see these junipers right there on it. Ideally, you may think spike. You may think velipar L. If this oak tree was not there, it'd be very easy to take that velipar applicator and spray a little bit of velipar down beneath these juniper trees and wipe them out. However, that oak tree is in the danger zone. It's close. So something I would encourage you to look at doing is like this little one right here. These over here, you could spray those with Tordon 22K. However, we get these up here. Yes, you could spray them, but it's going to cost a lot. I'm going to say your probably best option would be to cut them down and treat the stumps. I see we have a question. And the answer to that question is typically two to three times the canopy size. And you can't, I'm going to encourage you to look at the label. And the main thing is look at the label. The label's always the law. But this right here would be close. If we go start talking absolutes and say maintain a minimum of 100 feet, that gets to their arguments or cause that oak trees are killed. Okay, here's something that we have right here. I see this pretty often. You have your big desirable trees right here. Then you have your fence line covered with green and brown. One thing you think about is you want to save these trees. However, you want to maintain your fence line and you want to maintain this area right here. You don't want the green and brown to move out to where it's covering this area. So one thing you could look at there is treating the base with remedy and diesel, driving down here in the fall and treating the stems. That would be a good method. The one thing I'm going to caution you about is remedy. It is a estral formulation. And if you use a estral formulation on a hot day, when it's above 90 degrees, that formulation can move up and it'll do some damage to the canopy of these trees. 
However, if you were to do it in the fall, or if you were to do it in the early, of the early cooler time of the morning, you'd be good. We are doing some stuff now that looks to be safe to use under hair. Only I'm not going to say it is safe to use until I've done a few more trials. Okay, here's your mesquite tree stuck growing up in the fence line. It's hard to see how tall this mesquite is, but the easiest method would be if you could go through and you could spray the leaves. Spray it with Sendero does good. However, if this had one stem instead of one, two, three, four, five, six stems, we can count very easy, you could tree to the base. However, with that many stems, it's going to be tougher to go through and treat each one. So if you could just go through and spray the canopy with Sendero, that'd be a good way to go on cleaning up that fence line. Right here, you have kind of an unusual situation. We kill it half of the tree very good. The other half still doing good. If you're going to be aerial spraying some of this, Chances are you'll get some on this tree and you'll wipe it out. However, maybe you can get up in here and spray this tree. I know some people have a sprayer that'll do pretty good. Something else you could do is this tree right here probably already has the rough bark on it. So you'd have to knock it up to 25% remedy. 75% diesel, you could treat these stems and clean it up. With that, I'm like, going to thank you for your time and please feel free to ask any questions. If you want to email me, my email address is on the Stephenville website. And I'd be happy to be any help that I can. Yes, you all feel free to type in the question on the chat pod. And uh, as the questions are coming in, let me just go ahead and and, uh, and say that at the end of this webinar, you going you should get a, a survey pop up. Uh, please uh, fill that out for us and help us in, in, improve and get better and bring you all some more information. And uh, the next thing I will say is our next webinar will be on July 2nd in Texas Water, Basic Laws of Current Hot Topics, and Tiffany May Tiffany Dow is going to be our speaker. So, Okay, I'm going to talk about surfactants for a little bit. There's two common types of surfactants. We have a methylated seed oil. That is known as MSO. If you're spraying green briar or if you're spraying prickly pear and it is hot, I'm going to recommend that you use a MSO. And if you use a MSO, I'm going to recommend you do it at 1%. Another common type of surfactant is non-ionic surfactant. It is known as NIS. If you're going to use the NIS, this does great on breaking through the natural plant burials. Spraying mesquite, spraying weeds, any of that stuff, the NIS does well. And you can use that at a much lower percentage, such as a quarter to one half percent, and it'll do good. A common NIS surfactant that I've used is known as Activator 90, Red Revel 90. Those are some that are good. Tractable Supply sells some that are okay. I've used them before too. I think Helena, their surfactant that is a good quality NIS is known as Induce. I'm not here to endorse any of them. I'm just saying I've used them and I've been happy with their success. Does that answer the question on surfactants? Okay, good deal. Glad I was able to help.
Yeah, Kathy had a question and says, so I should you be using different surfactants for pear and for mesquite? On the prickly pear, if it's good and wet, the and even on a good day, the non-ionic surfactant would do good would do fine. When it gets really hot and when that prickly pear gets a little bit tougher, it's when you have added benefit from using that methylated seed or surfactant. Either one though would do okay. I'm just saying typically if you use the MSO on a tough plant barrier to get through, I would say the MSO will give you a little bit higher mortality. And yes, you can use liquid dish soap. However, look at the prices. You can buy a gallon of Red River 90, which is a good quality non-ionic surfactant, for right around 15 bucks. So you're not going to save that much money. There's a couple more questions coming in, but I'll just let you read them instead of me reading them. How's that sound? So we catch them in the yeah, that's what I'm doing now, Pete. Yeah, Malcolm asked a question. Okay, I see Malcolm's question right there. What is recommended on fence lion with green brow, broadleaf grasses, very large poison ivy vines growing into desirable trees? The best thing now would be remedy and diesel there on the base. That was a pretty good broad spectrum one. I talked a little bit about that remedy and saparel i'm seeing that do very good and that's doing okay it's not harming the trees only let me get a little bit more trials done before i tell you that's safe to use okay i see norman's question how quickly do the herbicides typically work on the more deciduous plants. I'm going to say those are like your junipers. And what I recommend is I try to convince people to leave the plant because none of this stuff is a hundred percent. If we spray mesquite, if we spray prickly pear, if we spray juniper, and if we get 90% mortality, we're going to be happy with it. So what I'm saying is some are going to be coming back. However, I would rather have it come back where I can see it, where it's up off the ground, than where it's down low. Because if it's down low, it's going to be buried in all the grass. So I'm going to say spray it. And you'll typically start seeing some side effects within a two to six weeks. On the mesquites, we can knock off the canopy in two to six weeks. On some prickly pear, you'll start seeing some slight yellowing at a couple of months. On the juniper, it may take a month or so before you start seeing the plant turn brown. But what I'm going to ask you to do is be patient. Does that answer the question, Norman? Okay, okay, good deal. Okay, Bob S. is asking a question. What of these products are you talking about are retracted? Anything with picloram in it is retracted. Tordon 22K is a retracted use product. Surmount is a retracted use product. Sendero which is a good product for mesquite, is not retracted. Velipar and Spike are not retracted. So you do not need a license to utilize those products.
And I see some other folks are typing. Uh, let me just mention that uh, with this Adobe Connect, there's actually a app that you could use on your on your phones or iPads where you could actually listen to us through your handheld device. Okay, I have a question. Is that something new from for Spike? No, Spike has been a not retracted use harbor site. The ADDF, it is a little bit new, but it's still been with us a long time. Okay, Norman is asking, does the diesel contaminate the ground or cause other environmental concerns? Well, to begin with, Norman, we're putting out a very small amount of diesel. If you use a X1 nozzle to treat to the base of a mesquite, to treat to the stump, or to go straight to the green bridle, you one gallon of diesel, you're going to be worn out before you finish up that gallon if you have the correct nozzle on. So no, we are not putting out enough to cause any environmental damage. And I'm recommending that you use very little. Tree to the base, get it wet, do not let it drip off. Uh, Kathy is asking a question. And Kathy says, yes, it kills stuff, it hits, so be careful. And that's exactly right. That is why I'm saying be careful what you spray. And do not go broadcasting diesel throughout the pastoral. Okay, Pam is saying, what about the cattle eating the sprayed plants? I know with the Sarmount, with the Sendero, and with the Tordon, there is no need to remove cattle out of the pasture after you have sprayed it. However, with the spike, I'm going to have to look at the label. I do not believe there was any grades and retractions. Only please check the label and make sure. Roger was saying he is in Williamson County, sandy soil, and have had a very wet year. Mesquites are very yellow-leafed. Do I have to wait to spray these? Roger, I'm up in Stephenville. We have a very sandy soil, and we've had 20-plus inches of rain for the month of May. Yes, we avoided some of the flooding that y'all had. Pat, I hope everything is okay. And yes, wait until those mesquites turn a dark green. Talk to your county agent there. Wait until the soil gets to be 75 degrees at 12 inches. And then you'll be good. If you spray now, you will not get the mortality rate that you won't. So I'm going to ask you to hold off until everything aligns before you go spray the mesquites. I hope that helps. Okay, seeing no more questions, I'd like to thank everybody for attending. I hope you all found this beneficial. And I hope you all join us next month to learn about the Texas water law. Oh, I see one more question coming in. Yes, and as, uh, again, uh, thank you all for attending. And if you're here for uh, CU credit, I asked earlier to Type in your email address, uh, please do so. And here you're going to get a, a survey pop-up on your browser. 
if it curves up to your screen, you can do look at the test bar. You see a little icon with three three fellas just click on it, and you should put you back into the webinar. Thank you all for attending. James, thank you. Thank you, Pete. I appreciate the hope. I don't see any more questions. I'm more.